So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for the Smith Young Alumni Council's webinar, How to Start a Side Hustle. My name is Mary Wagner. I work in the Office of Alumni Relations at the Smith School, and I'm really excited to have you here tonight. I have a few administrative notes before I turn it over to tonight's moderator. Just so you're aware, um, tonight's webinar is being recorded. I ask the audience to please mute your microphones to cut down on the background noise. Um, feel free to enter questions into the chat as we go throughout the event. We'll address questions at two points throughout the event, um, but you can put them in the chat as soon as you think of them. And we recommend turning off your video and putting your Zoom on speaker view so you are able to um, see a full size image of who is speaking. So I want to say thank you to the Young Alumni Council Planning Committee for putting this event together. John Gillick, Brittany McCoy, Ryan Bailey Nally, and Ryan Schuler. And now I'm going to introduce our moderator for tonight, John Gillick. John graduated from Maryland Smith in 2015 with a degree in accounting. John is a senior accountant at Kaiser Permanente and is ready to get us started tonight. And John, take it away. Thanks, Mary. I appreciate it. So to give the audience a brief rundown of how this event is set up, we've divided the event into four topic areas. After the first two, we'll have a brief break for questions, then finish up the last two topics and close out the event with an open Q&A session. As Mary mentioned before, feel free to pop your questions into the chat box at any time. So we'll start off by introducing our panelists. Uh, so please share your name, grad year, tell us a little bit about your company, let's say a two to three sentence explanation of what the company does and when it was founded. We'll start with AD and Amanda. Hey guys, good evening. Uh, my name is AD. And I'm Amanda. And we are the co-founders of the DAPO Group. Uh, so we are actually founded in 2016. Um, the name uh, is a play of our last name, um, at a DAPO, DAPO. Uh, it means delivering answers for property ownership. Um, so we're a top 10 real estate team in the DC and Maryland region. Um, and we help clients uh, with the acquisition and liquidation of residential and commercial property. So now we'll move on to David. Awesome. My name is David Engel. I graduated from University of Maryland in 2015. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Upright Labs. Upright Labs is a multi-channel software provider for secondhand retailers, Goodwill, Salvation Armies, Habitat for Humanities, all across the US. Um, our company, we only had four employees in the beginning of 2020. We now will be ending the year with about 18 employees and we currently power over 2,000 secondhand retailers all across the US. Thanks, David. Josh? Hello everybody, I'm Josh Rosenthal. I graduated with my MBA and Master of Science in Operations Research in 2007. And I am the co-founder of CloudSploit, which is a high value service to keep your cloud um, infrastructure configured securely. So I kind of explained this non-technically by saying, uh, if you had a Mini Cooper, it's easy to know which doors are open, closed, and unlocked. But consider the alternative if you were in some type of a convention center with uh, hundreds of doors and thousands of people coming through them. How would you know which need to be uh, secured in, in which manner? So this was actually started as an open source project in 2015 by my co-founder, Matthew Fuller. And I got involved soon afterwards and uh, bootstrapped uh, this thing on only our meager revenues. Thanks, Josh. And last but absolutely not least, Jasmine. Thanks, John. Hi, I'm Jasmine Sneed. I'm actually a current student, but also an alumna. I graduated in 2017 with a degree in government and politics, but I'm back because I'm getting my degree in an MBA in MPP. I graduate in 2021 uh, with that degree, really focusing on entrepreneurship and finance as well. Um, but as far as my company, it's called Aurora Tights and actually started with fellow Terps as we were students. And what the story is that we were all lifetime performers. I started skating at the age of five and for my entire performance career, I never could have performance apparel in my skin color. 
I would always diet myself in my bathtub. And as you might guess, it was messy and time consuming and expensive and my hands will be dyed for days. But from that experience, you kind of realize, wow, there's a whole market out there. And so my co-founders, I offer the full color spectrum from the fairest to the deepest shades and for all sizes. All right. Thanks, Jasmine. And thank you, everyone. As you can see, we've got an all-star panel tonight. So the first section is to how to move your idea into a side hustle. So from ideation to moving it in, into actually action. So keeping your answer to about a minute, can you please share how you came up with your particular side hustle and how it progressed? We'll start with David. Yeah, so I was actually, what I was doing in college is I was buying and selling inventory from Goodwills and secondhand retailers all across the US. Um, I was actually the founder of Startup Village, which was an entrepreneurship house um, for, for students at Maryland to be able to live affordably on campus. And so what I was doing is I was buying thousands of pounds of Patagonia from Goodwills and as well as recyclers, and we would bring it into this house. And it got into a point where I had so much inventory, I actually threw my mattress out the window, slept in the hallway and used my bedroom at a fulfillment center. Um, and really just saw that there was a lot of opportunity in reselling inventory online. Started researching and realizing that every single item I was selling could have been sold online by a Goodwill. So we then created Upright Labs to really help Goodwills get the most value out of their items. Um, so really just started as a side hustle, started really researching the sector and saw just what, you know, how much opportunity there, there was and really then started building the company. And now we're a full-fledged business supporting most of the Goodwills in the U.S. Awesome. Josh? Um, okay. Uh, well, I mentioned uh, Matthew Fuller is the inventor of um, the open source um, uh, application. And so he had an idea that he was going to go and host it and, uh, and serve it to people and actually had a, um, a couple early clients was making about uh, $40 a month and posted on Reddit that uh, he had this idea and could somebody uh, you know, go and make a, a business out of this. And from my point of view, I was uh, already working in the AppSec space. I already had uh, pre-sales and customer success experience. Um, and knew the infrastructure that we needed to get and grow sales. So uh, we really just started uh, getting involved and just uh, working together. We used uh, the slicing pie methodology to split um, the equity of the fledging idea. And with a couple uh, little tweaks and configurations to how we're offering and, um, and um, packaging the service, we just started getting uh, customers and um, growth hacking and uh, bootstrapping it up from there. Slicing pie methodology. We may have to come back to that one a little later. All right, thank you. So Jasmine. Absolutely. So we started this just based off a pain point in our lived experiences. And that's someplace the first place to go. But from there, we worked with the Dingman Center and just really started to do customer interviews to figure out I know we want this product, but does everybody want this product? Um, and from there, it became something bigger than some, our own creation. We have a brand that people became in love with. We got so much customer feedback on where we wanted to go with it, what we needed to expand into, and we kind of just grew from there, really implementing social media from influencers, really being able to expand out from B2C in the retail space. That was our, how we were able to transition from our idea to a business that we could scale. Excellent. Thank you. AD and Amanda? Sure. So uh, for us, it started with um, a book uh, by Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, and, you know, one of the key takeaways from the book is that uh, most successful people actually have some type of real estate in their portfolio. Um, and we started to think, you know, you know, kind of like a light bulb that went on was that there are actually folks that help people acquire these assets. Um, and it's actually um, a real estate professional. So, uh, we decided that we wanted to get our real estate license, um, and um, it actually took me eight months uh, before I made my first sale. Yeah. Um, and you know, I make a joke all the time when we speak. It was um, a property in Baltimore City, oh. and it was uh, twenty-two thousand dollars, and that was not the commission. That's the actual sales price of the home. <laughs> um, so from there, it took about two years, um, and essentially the goal was just to make uh, what we made. Um, you know, at our full-time jobs, uh, uh, you know, with, with our side hustle. Um, so I left my job first and I like to say I co-hearsed Amanda. Yeah, <laughs> aggressively. 
uh, lobby, yep. <laughs> if you will. Um, yeah, he, um, I, I, I saw it. I saw it for myself. I was always, I was always there. You know, I was always transacting, working in the background, watching from a distance, but not being an active partner. And one thing that he actually folded towards me was that, hey, Amanda, you have this, this gift for Gab. You have this gift of being able to connect with people. And I think that where you are currently, I was working at a physical therapy office at the time. He said, I think where you are, you know, you have this awesome degree in communications and you, you, you just, you don't communicate. You just say, check in, check out. Like, <laughs> um, I think that there would be an opportunity. Um, I think that there would be an opportunity for you to be able to, to leverage yourself in a better effort. So he, he told me to take, my journey was to take that leap. <laughs> he, he said, look, I, like we can make what you make in your salary. Like take that leap in and, and jump in for sure. Thank you. So keeping in the same vein, it's apparent that we have a variety of different ways to progress once we have the idea. Where do you recommend starting for someone who has an idea but maybe doesn't know where to quite begin? We'll start with Josh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in short, I would simply say find a way to get started, right? If you don't have your, um, for me, I, I come from uh, the ideas of uh, a product that we're delivering uh, or a service online. So for me, it's um, find a way to get started. Ask people you know who would be prospective customers, what they would think of this offering. Uh, once you have the idea, at least in a, in a rough idea, um, understood that you can um, begin to put those ideas into creating a mock-up and ask them again. From a mock-up, move to an MVP, you know, just a minimum viable product and uh, ask them to actually use it. Um, possibly even go and charge them for it. And at that point, you have already started momentum. You can continue to iterate from there and increase your price or volume. Thanks. David? Yeah, you know, for me, it's always finding a way, and I know I talked to the panelists before, you know, a few, a few weeks ago when we spoke, it's finding the cheapest way to create an idea. I have this great idea, let me go out and raise capital and then I'm gonna go ahead and build it or I don't know how to code, so I don't know how to do it. And I talk to a lot of students and a lot of alumni about the ideas they have and my whole philosophy is get something out quickly and test will anyone even need it. Even when we're launching new products at Upright, I'm always saying, how can we get something out? How can we test it really cheaply, learn and then iterate it? So if you're trying to do an idea right now and say for instance, it involves code but you're not a developer, Go look at bubble.com or go look at Adalo that is a, you know, a no code tool. Um, and you can go ahead and, and do that yourself. You know? So it's, it's really figuring out how to do it in an inexpensive way and see if you can get someone to pay you 10 bucks for it. If you can get someone to pay you $10, you can get someone else to pay you $10 and they'll start going compared to spending two years of the whole business plan and ideation of it and then going to market, it's probably too late. So kind of like what, what Yasmin was doing in, in her backyard of dying the type, if you have an idea, do it for yourself. If it's going to work, then you can scale it to Jan. Great point. Yasmin? I think, yeah, that was a perfect transition to me, but I absolutely couldn't agree more with Josh and David were saying. The, the cheaper you can kind of get it started, and I think one of the biggest points I hear a lot of people say is like, I want it to be perfect. I want to make sure that I'm proud of it. I want to make sure that it's so good, but no matter what, whatever you create as your MVP stage, it's going, you're going to iterate because you're just basing off of your own perception. But once you can know more about what customers want, maybe they interact with the product differently. Maybe they have this view. It's going to change throughout the process. And looking back, my first dyed tight looks completely different than my products now, but that's okay. It's a natural transition. So really just want to echo that. Just get started, do as cheaply as you can, and don't let perfectionism keep you from getting started. Do you still have those original tights? I do. We do still have them. Do I wear them? No. <laughs> Very cool. AD and Amanda. Um, I, I'm going to just piggyback on what everyone else is saying. Um, it's, it's repetition, 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 but um, we're all, we're in the service business. Um, we don't necessarily have um, an app or, or product. We're in, we're in service. So what's really cool is um, being able to, when you're picking someone to, to, copy, if you will, or picking someone to be a mentor. And so instead of saying, so instead of saying, Hey, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so, can you be my mentor? One of the really great ideas that we actually came up with was offering yourself for free. 
what the, the actuality is, the people that you want to mentor you are usually killing it in their, in their fields. And the reality is, is that they don't actually have the time to give their time to you for free. So one of the really cool things that I got from one of my coaches is saying, hey, if you have somebody that you admire that's killing it in their field that has an iteration of what you want to do and you want to pick their brain, start by offering yourself. Offer, take something off of their plate in order to trade, trade secrets, if you will. So that's one of the biggest things. So rethink how you think mentorship. Don't, ask, don't just ask someone, to, hey, can you be my mentor? That's, that's asking a lot of somebody. It's asking a lot of responsibility. In actuality, ask, hey, how can I be a contribution to you in your venture? And by the way, hey, this is what I'm thinking about getting off the ground as well. A great point, thank you. So now we kind of know how to get our idea uh, to a phase where, where, where we can actually start. Our second section is gonna be how to come back from the unfortunate reality of failure. So the first question is, social media tends to depict the highlights of entrepreneurship rather than the failures. Can you share a bit about, about a, a failure slash challenge you have faced and how you were able to overcome it? We'll start with Yasmin. I think one of the keys that I always go back to is the importance of making data-driven decisions. I know that's something extremely pushed by Smith, but it's so true and it's apparent in our business. When we first started, we really wanted to make sure we had inclusive products, so we wanted the full color spectrum from the fairest to the deepest shades. But what we realized is we chose those shades based off of things that we wanted. So we wanted to make sure we had a very, very, very deep color that we thought was very rich. However, from our customer interviews and focus groups, our customers actually weren't liking the color options that we chose. And so because we're creating a product that requires inventory, requires planning, requires samples and everything so far, things like that, um, it really is important to make sure you know the data first, you know what the customers want prior to, so you don't have to take all that on hand. And so that's a lesson that we had to learn. Of course, now we still, we were able to use those products and other, cu other customers love them. But from there, we were able to expand, offer more products that first are rooted in the human-centered experience about what the customer actually wants, so. Katie and Amanda? Um, <laughs> entre entrepreneurship and failure are two sides of the same coin. Simple as that. I really love how you highlighted the fact that social media only shows the wins. When we won 30 under 30, when we won Washingtonian, the cover of Washingtonian magazine, when we won all those different, different things, it's like, wow, you guys are killing it. However, you know, I almost died in between every single one of those successes. That's, that's a huge part. So one of the biggest things that I want future entrepreneurs and people who have their, who have their side hustles is to get comfortable with sucking get so hungry and thirsty for humility because the reality is on the other side of that failure if you're smart you catch the lesson <laughs> because that and those and the cool thing is those lessons begin to compound and be and that's when like all these all these like bosses on this panel are talking about different iterations of their product and different opportunities where they made their situation, their product, their software better. And the reality is it's because they hit a wall that was called failure where someone said, you know what, this sucks. This is not that great. In, re in real estate, it comes with losing. It comes with losing offers. It comes with losing negotiations. It comes with like big financial losses that are your fault every single time. When it's in real estate, they look at you. You did, the, you did not negotiate well. You did not acquire this asset and it does not, it, it, the, the price per square feet doesn't make sense for my bottom line. You know, all, the, all those different conversations, you're the problem. So the cool thing about failure is the opportunity to learn and to get better. So when you lose that offer, okay, how can I make sure for the next offer that I write that I'm negotiating or I'm putting the right turns into this contract to make sure that I crush every other offer. Or when I'm going to acquire or liquidate this asset, how can I make sure that I have the proper language and I'm prepared to negotiate against my opponent when we're in the conversation or in the boardroom, you know, talking over this multi-million dollar asset. So get comfortable with it. Get comfortable with failure. It's, that's the best part about our entrepreneurship because on the other side, you're just gonna get better. <laughs> All right, thanks, Adi and Amanda. David? Yeah, you know, it, 
it's exactly what Amanda was just talking about, failure, it's, it's gonna happen, right? If, if you start a business, and this is what you know, a lot of people believe is you're gonna make a ton of money being an entrepreneur. When you start out, you better be prepared for at least the first three years to be making very little or no money. Um, and so that's to start, you gotta be prepared for that. Second, you gotta be prepared that even when you are successful, even if your business is doing well, you're gonna have so many failures on a daily basis. Whether that is you lose a sales, you lose a sales pitch, you lose a client, your your new feature, your new proposal, whatever it is, doesn't work. So failure is constantly happening. And I can tell you for myself, I've built multiple businesses, right? So I've built a food truck, I've built a real estate business. Now I'm building Upright Labs, and Upright Labs is the most successful business I've had to date. But every single business I've created, every single failure I've had along the way has taught me different things. Right? It's taught me how to actually you know, manage my books properly, how to handle a balance sheet, how to do p &L, how to sell new clients. So it's making sure that every single step of the way you learn from the failures, um, but that going in, you know that you're not going to be successful from day one. A lot of time, a lot of effort you're going to put into it, and you're going to have to assume that it's going to take a while for you to actually make a true salary um, to sustain yourself. Mm. You know, uh, I'm listening uh, to your answer and David, to what you just said. Earlier, you had this idea, David, about, uh, well, you didn't use these words, but failing fast, right? Go and get started. If there's a problem, go and iterate. In fact, uh, each of us have talked about iteration um, and, uh, and learning. So I think that this is a very important topic, the idea of there's failures and not just celebrating the successes, celebrating these failures as well. So I, I, as I'm saying, I really appreciate this question and I want to go in and talk about myself as a uh, as a failure but something with you know that I learned from and so I think that my first big failure was when um, I started a company called interactive instruction so this is many many years ago um, you know before uh, YouTube uh, you know was really pushing video and I created a, a, a choose your own adventure for online videos and uh, you know, based upon your interaction, it built an anonymous profile and delivered you to this optimal part of the uh, the company's website. So the idea was that you could go and watch a uh, a, gol a video about a, a golf lesson and start to understand is the person interested in golf products or golf apparel. And then, as I said, go and deliver the person to the uh, that you know anonymous visitor to the right spot. But um, I wasn't uh, my timing wasn't there. And the biggest rejection I got over and over again um, was, especially with download speeds at that time, that video will never be big on the internet. And, um, you know, that's just how it went. And, uh, you know, I, I had, uh, I was all into that business and uh, it did not go anywhere. So learned a lot from it. Uh, learned a lot uh, about myself from it. Took it a, a bit hard and um, eventually just moved on to the, next uh, attempt and, and that's one of the things is you may have a great idea right ad and amanda may have a fantastic house to actually sell but it's all about timing so even if you have an amazing product like it doesn't matter it's the same thing with the admin she could bring a great new product to market but if someone else beats it or maybe it's a few years early that new product that you just launched is going to fail so it's not only getting it to market fast and iterating but it's also making sure timing is right so it's really a lot of things to balance um, to properly execute. That's a great point. And, you know, so I think we all need to just learn to lean into the failure just because you fail first. It doesn't mean that your product is bad. It doesn't mean your service is, is something that people don't want. Learn from your failures, use it as a tool for growth. And most importantly, as we've been saying, fail fast. Don't let the fear keep you from pursuing action. So, this is actually my, my favorite part, my favorite section talking about failures. I think it's so important to highlight what we don't see on social media. So thank you guys. So now we'll have our first Q&A break and I will turn it over to Mary. Thanks, John. Um, so we had this question come through, which is kind of on the same vein. What is the biggest misconception that you had about starting a business or that others may have about starting a business? And again, feel free to, if you have other questions, put them in the chat and I'll read them for you all. Ooh, can I go? <laughs> By all means. 
<laughs> oh my gosh, that you get your time back. Fire your boss. Do things on your own time. Be your own boss. All that foolishness. Oh my God. Like there, there is, there is some truth to that. You are your own boss, but guess you are your own boss in, the, in, the, in a way, but guess who becomes your new boss? Your customers, your clients, your acquisitioners, your shareholders, all those people <laughs> become your new bosses because your responsibility is to them. So that I think that's the, the biggest thing is that you 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 switch and you you are you're so focused on providing a high level product service software etc. Um, the other part is your time. You, you get ready to put in a lot of hours, and and it's not because you have to. It's because honestly, when you're when you're really onto something, you want to. You become obsessive about it so we're, we're on average in the very beginning in the early time in the early years year one and two we we were putting in 13 hours easily easily yeah i would say another thing is that you get to do what you love um that is a big misconception absolutely um, you actually have to do what generates business um and when you built the business or, or scale the business you can then hire people to do things that you don't like to do right and then you can concentrate on your 20 percent um so um, and another thing is the income. So, you know, I, I think, you know, David and Josh and Jasmine have said it, uh, you know, you think once you, you know, you leave your job, you're going to start making that income and it takes time and eventually you get there, you know, if you're able to put in the time, the effort and the hours. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are two really big things that um, I did not see coming. <laughs> yeah, being broke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can pop in too. Um, yeah, bootstrapping is definitely real and also with up to time, everything that they're saying is so true. But another thing I realized is like, it doesn't, I always imagine that the idea is the big thing. Like once you have that really cool idea, that's what, that's the hard part. Not at all. The hard part is actually the follow through, the execution, the continued, because you, as you say, you are your own boss. So there's not somebody telling you, oh, now you need to do this, this, and this. You know, the buck stops there with you. And so it's very much, you have to continue to be fueled, continue to move on with the next situation. As we all know, things change like a global pandemic. So you gotta be able to be adapted to the environment. And so, you know, it doesn't just start with the idea that is the itty bitty very beginning. Um, and it's so much more beyond that. Yeah, absolutely. And when touching on that idea of the idea, right? People have, and David, you had mentioned this, people had ideas all the time and, and they're really possibly worth a cup of coffee. Uh, but it's really the implementation that makes that million dollar idea worth a million dollars. So, you know, this, this misconception, I would actually kind of just call it like this. Um, the misconception is that it's hard and the other misconception is that it's easy. And so it's, you know, uh, easy to get started, but it's hard to actually make it go somewhere. I think another aspect of it is it's the misconception of how glamorous it is, right? So, you know, when you get started, I can tell you for everyone on this call, when I got started actually truly being an entrepreneur in college or right after I graduated, I didn't even have any place to live. So I actually slept in the University of, Bil University of Maryland building for a month um, under a table. And so I would go to sleep when everyone left the room and I'd wake up when everyone came back in and no one knew that, like a few of my friends did. But the point is, is that you have to, you do what you have to do to make the business work to start. So you have to, you know, show the business is growing, show that there's certain things in the front end, but on the back end, you're dealing with a lot of stuff yourself. So it's a whole misconception of what entrepreneurship truly is. No, you're not driving a Lamborghini. No, you're not throwing cash out left and right. You're, you're really struggling to, to you know, make, pay your bills to start and actually even go out for a restaurant. You'll find that the first few years, you will go to the cheapest food you can get and probably go to your friend's places for meals. Um, so that's one of the biggest misconceptions in my mind. Thank you all. So Kate asks, when do you know when to go from making it your side hustle to a full-time job? It depends, and I'll just be brief on this, is it depends on what your financial situation is. If you have a family, if you have bills to pay, it's a different answer versus if you, you know, you can live off $1,500 a month. Um, if you have a full-time job right now and you want your side hustle to take over fully, you better make sure that side hustle, you're working nights and weekends to get it to a point where it's making the same amount of money as your full-time job, because it's gonna take years 
to that side hustle to actually get up to that point. So just be cautious before you, you quit your full-time job. I can have a, oh. oh, go ahead, Amanda, go ahead. I have a note to that, um, to what David said. Um, the, the biggest inhibitor of lateral growth and entrepreneurship is when your creativity and thinking and problem solving is inhibited up from the stress of having a lack of funds. So if you have a job right now and you have that be and that's contributing to the side hustle, keep it. Because the last thing you're going to want to have to do is choose between buying the materials that are necessary to, to acquire this next customer and eating. Which one are you going to choose? You're going to choose to eat. You're going to choose personal comforts every single time. So always keep the job until, like David said, we did, and we literally did that, until it replaces the income. Because you don't want to have to choose between your dreams and utilities. Couldn't have said it better. I'm, I'm also in the process. Like I said, I'm a full-time student, but also Aurora, I would say, is a full-time along with it. But I think the biggest things I have in mind is making sure that I have all my expenses covered for at least six months. There's a lot of volatility with entrepreneurship and, you know, people have different risk tolerances, but making sure that you have enough for you and your situation. David said it best, very business school answer that it depends on what, what you have going on around you, but making sure that your emotional stress is being cared for. I think that's a big thing. So knowing yourself, knowing your risk tolerance, I think that's a big teller when it's time to go full time. All right, thank you. So Richard asks, how do you know you have a business versus just a hobby? Since if you don't have willing paying customers, you don't have a viable business. I think you need to find a customer, honestly. If it's a, if you currently just have a, a side thing that you're working on, but no one's willing to pay, I think it's still a hobby. Once you get to a point where you can at least get one customer, even if it's paying $10 a month, then it's a business. So if you can get, you can convince that one person to pay, that's when it transitions from, in a sense, just a hobby to a business that you can grow. Now the size of business is depending on how much revenue you can bring in. Yeah. You might also want to go and in, in addition to that, consider what it is your intention, what your intention is for this side hustle. Some people might just like to make a craft and uh, sell them when they make them. Um, is that a business? Sure, you know, I can go and be a, a potter and um, make some uh, wonderful mugs and sell them on Etsy and that's great. But if you're looking to go and, and to grow this thing to, uh, to truly be what you live off of, then we go back to uh, what Amanda was saying with, uh, you know, with uh, your tolerance for the risk and the lifestyle that uh, you want to live. Abin, sorry if I mispronounced that, he asks, um, for AB and Amanda, how did you guys find your first client? What were the greatest challenges you found when finding your first client? Yeah, so my first client actually came from my uh, little sister. Uh, it was um, her friend's brother, and he was a first-time investor, and he, uh, you know, wanted to get into real estate. So, um, you know, people who already love like us, right, which we like to say is our SOI, our sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. um, and then as the business grew, uh, we started to create um, a marketing budget, you know, because, I mean, every business, right, one of your number one thing is how do I lead generate? Right. You know, how do I bring more business in? Yep. Um, and, you know, in the beginning parts, um, I, I, this used to keep me up because without, you know, leads, there is no business, right? Um, so um, in the beginning, again, it was just really word of mouth, uh, doing a lot of um, the low market budget stuff. But as we grew the business, we actually created- Sales funnels. Yep, sales funnels, which Amanda um, is in charge of. Um, and um, and that's actually helpful. Just to uh, Abin, I, I think that's your name, Alicia. Abin, yeah. Um, so it started with just people who know us, like us, and love us, and trust us. Mm -hmm. And um, my first, his first client was his sister's friend. My first client was my mom. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, it started with just the, those people, and then and, and then we found ways to compound that and scale that. Mm -hmm. 
moms are the best first clients. Aren't they? Oh my <laughs> they really God. are. She just, and she surprised me because I wasn't like a whole house. I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that at all. So, but she believed in me and she, she always saw me and she either saw lawyer, finance, Wall Street, or like, she was like you. So she was excited when she saw that. All right, thank you all. There's a couple more questions, but we're gonna save those until our um, final Q&A. But I'm gonna turn it back over to John for our prepared questions. Thanks, Mary, and, and thank you all for the great questions. So we've talked about how to get started and how to address failure. Now let's talk about scaling. So I wanna begin with the question of how do you determine if your company can or should scale versus keeping it more as a side hustle? And we'll start with Aidy and Amanda. Yeah, so a couple of questions that um, you, you, know, you want to ask yourself is, uh, you know, when are you really passionate about the idea, right? Are you willing to go when everybody tells you no, that it actually sucks or it's not going to go anywhere? Um, and then you have to ask yourself, is the idea big enough, right? You know, can um, I grow and scale this into something that other people can also um, find the epic why in, right, in my world? Um, and then the third thing is, um, you know, what is the widest possible market for my service? You know, is there, can I reach an audience that is beyond my local area? Uh, could it be, um, you know, nationally? Could it be statewide? Um, and then, you know, we have to look at the profit, right? Because we are in business to make money. So, you know, what do the profit margins look like? Um, is there enough for myself? Is there enough for our investors and our shareholders? Um, and if, you know, the last question we asked ourselves is if people wanted to invest in the business, is there, um, a good return as well? So, um, these are the questions that we, we ask ourselves and if everything is a yes, then we know that we're ready to scale and go to the next level. Thanks guys. David? Yeah, I really think one of the first things to look at is, you know, like they were just saying of, you know, are you passionate about it? It's are you passionate and also how big is the market, right? You know, when, when I was in college, I always was looking at, great, I can sell this item in College Park, I'll do well. Um, college Park is not that big, right? It's, it's, you know, can you scale across the U.S.? In the U.S., can you grow into a $5 million business, a $10 million business? And then do you even want to scale internationally? So it's looking at all those different components and, and figuring out the profit margin behind it, right? If, if you're a real estate business, Maybe you want to scale to 10 or 20 employees. Maybe you'll be comfortable there. Maybe your goal is to scale to 100 employees. But maybe you have a software business where you want to scale bigger. So it's looking at all the different aspects of it to figure out in your mind, what is success? Does success mean $100,000 a year profit, 200,000, a few million? It's looking at all those components, but it's really at the end of the day, just start going. Just see what happens. Because even if you have a goal of scaling it to a million dollars a year, you better get the first thousand dollars first before you actually do the million because your entire business will break from the time you hit a ten thousand dollars and want to go to a hundred thousand everything is going to break so all your plans are going to go out the window whatever business plan you've written so really just focus on how can you make that first thousand dollars and then start figuring out things as you go and do you really want to scale it beyond that really good points there so what we've you know already talked about is uh, your lifestyle. What is you're expecting, not just from the revenue, but also the type of uh, and size of business that you want to run, and also your tolerance for risk. So um, can you survive on that current revenue stream? And what would happen if you fail within three months, within twelve months? You know what would be the result of that? So another thing that has already been uh, talked about is going and finding your market, and sometimes the market is. Uh, can seem big as in, hey, we're going to go and deliver this across the world. Fantastic. But you also realize that your market is actually a niche in that. So in uh, the founding of CloudSploit, I used this long tail strategy where I kind of got that, that Gauss curve and said, hey, you know what, we're going to go out on that third standard deviation and everything we do is going to uh, be delivered towards cloud security enthusiasts. And that's exactly what we did. And we became known with them. And then we moved back to the second standard deviation and had even more people that were interested because those people in the second standard deviation wanted to be more uh, security minded like those experts that we originally um, gained traction with in the third standard deviation. 
So even though we would wake up uh, each morning and have sales come in from people around the world, um, we realized that the, the market was in delivering um, to cloud security experts and people that wanted to be cloud security experts. And then eventually we moved into uh, that first standard deviation for everybody. And just like was mentioned just a moment ago, the product had to change, the offering, the pricing, the infrastructures, all these things needed to go and change to be able to scale it up and um, meet each of those, in my case, expanding markets. Those are some great points. Thank you, Josh. Jasmine? I think all the great things have been said. This is such an amazing panel, but I guess one of the key things that I always do that we, we just incorporate for our business is continually setting these targets so that it doesn't feel like, oh, I'm just creating this one big goal, but constantly having these goals and we can start off smaller with a thousand dollars. I like, I like that and being able to push further and further past it. But another thing, big thing for us is you kind of also know if like, if you just can't do it anymore, like maybe like for us, we were constrained on our team. We started off with three of us, three students. And now um, this year became but we knew we couldn't do it without other people joining in so sometimes you know it's time to scale if it's like i know i need to get there but i can't do it in my current space it's time for me to start adding any of the people resources whatever needs to be added in order to get me where i need to go excellent so the key point i want to highlight here is defining your success because truly it's up to you to decide what you want from this venture no one else with our next question, we're going to ask, how do you maintain work-life balance while you scale? This is something that we've kind of touched on a little bit, but I want to kind of dive a little bit deeper on this. And we'll start with David. You don't when you start. Um, now, to be completely honest, you know, the work-life balance, when I started the first year or two, um, I didn't really have it. Um, you know, my girlfriend was really understanding the entire time when I would put in 14, 16, sometimes 18 hour days and I'd work weeks on Saturdays. Um, and then luckily as we've grown, we've been able to hire more employees. We'll now be a team of 18 by the end of the year. And I've started to realize that I need to get out of working in the business and start working on the business. And we're putting those processes in place where I can actually start enjoying life more. So I really now am focusing where I'll start working at 8 a.m. and I'll go till 6, 6.30. And that to me is an amazing change. So um, work-life balance is really difficult. If you wanna be able to focus on multiple different things, you have to pick what you wanna focus in. So if you care about your family and you care about working out and you care about your business, great. Focus on those three, your, your relationships with friends is probably. So really figure out what your main areas are and just double down on those. Um, so you can kind of have a, have a work-life balance. But like AD and Amanda said, uh, once you start entrepreneurship, your boss are your customers. So you better be prepared to, even if they call you at one in the morning, which has happened to me, a client called me at one in the morning and you better believe I woke up and answered it. Um, you're going to do whatever you need to do to, to make sure that you can thrive. Mm. Excellent. You know, this is actually... Uh, one of the issues or one of the items that I put into uh, an article that had uh, preceded this discussion. Um, and, you know, um, the more the business scales, the, the harder this becomes. Um, and uh, sometimes people talk about this whole uh, work hard, play hard, but I don't think that's applicable to the entrepreneur's life because you're just working hard. And I look at this as that resultant balance right? You're going to go and sacrifice. You're going to go and give up things um, and personal time, etc. But that is what it takes to go and uh, hope to have the potential to make this business uh, a success. So it really comes down to, you know, success is about sacrifice. What are you willing to give up and, uh, and to do to try to achieve your goals? Josh, when you play hard, do you feel that you play harder now? Because like for me, I feel that like I will go like a six month stretch of not going out or doing anything. And pre COVID, I would do that one time after six months and I would find myself going way harder to make up for the last six months. <laughs> Is it harder or have you just gone uh, a little bit soft uh, ability to play and therefore to everyone else it feels normal, but. Uh... Probably. <laughs> I would have two hot chocolates instead of one. <laughs> Jasmine? 
Yeah, I just really couldn't couldn't agree more with everything that's been been said. I think that um, I guess a key piece is just. Sorry, I'm losing a little bit of connection. Can you guys still hear me? Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I think I think literally echo everything that Josh said. I think it's finding that balance for you, or a way that I kind of think about it. Um, actually, a friend of mine described it is about finding that harmony. Because it might look different for you at different times. It might be, again, I'm a student, so I'm going to put in a student perspective. But, okay, if I have an exam next week, I'm going to be more in the books. But if I'm preparing for a pitch, I might be 80% pitch, maybe 5% books at that time frame, and that's okay. I think just finding that harmony that works for you and making sure that you have that that's centered for your life. Because it's very much anything goes for entrepreneurship, which is really a great part about it. But you just got to look deep within and figure out what works best for you. That's a great point. Thank you, Jasmine. Adi and Amanda. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought he was going to go. <laughs> but, um, so for us, um, I, I have to agree with David, Josh, and Jasmine. It's, it's being intentional about your breaks. I have to agree with David and Josh. Now at this point in our life, we do play. We play hard now. <laughs> oh my God. Like call somebody. <laughs> and then and then also and then also one thing that we um, in this point of our career is that we actually bake in our breaks into our financial calendar. So we associate our goal setting, like what how many how many amount of contracts per month need to be in the pipeline, how many customers, how many calls, all those different things. We work backwards. And then we also set up our, our, our operations staff, our, 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 um, our employees, we set them up to say, hey, Adi and Amanda are going to be in Bora Bora with no Wi-Fi access. <laughs> this is what this looks like. No Wi-Fi access is probably not, we're not there yet. <laughs> but, 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 uh, but, uh, but that's it. We, we bake it in. We, we plan for our breaks. And, and at this point in our life, it's four times um, a year. We travel four at a minimum four times a year, every quarter. Yeah, so, you know, if it's not on your calendar, it doesn't exist, right? So we're already planning 2021. Yeah. Uh, so it's already on the calendar, and then we work, like Amanda said, backwards, and we work everybody around those set dates. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't always like that, right? It's taken almost five years to be able to do this. And ask Amanda, you know, oh, yeah. on, our, on our wedding anniversary, I was, oh. like, worried about the business. Oh, I'm my like, God. You know, because I'm like, I'm going to come back and there's going to be no business, right? Because we're, we're here on vacation. Picking up the phone at dinner on your wedding anniversary in Jamaica. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's just that's the life of entrepreneurship is what you signed up for. Um, Ooh, but, and loading your employees, too. So when you, when, when you have employees, loading them up with work to prepare for the time that you are away so that there's no funny business on the clock. Like, they, like they have so much to do while Excellent. Thank you all. So this is going to be our last section, how to determine success. Clearly, all of our panelists here are successful. Now I want to get to the big money question. This is why we're all here. This is why we paid the big bucks for this webinar. Can you share your secret sauce with our audience? I'm going to start with Josh. Okay. Um I think one thing you just heard in the, the last round uh, of answers to the question was predefined goals. You know, otherwise you're just chasing a, uh, a moving target. So in this case, you also have to be honest with yourself and why you're doing this. Um, is it the money or is the money just simply a quantitative measure of your ability to implement an idea? For me, it's more of the latter. I had a childhood dream of bringing something new and innovative to market and exit for a certain amount. And um, I've done that. You know, that, that achievement is unlocked. But um, without that predefined uh, goal or those predefined goals, you're just going to compare yourself to new Joneses and uh, end up forever chasing uh, a moving target. So define success. Come back to defining success. So crucial. Thank you, Josh. Jasmine? Absolutely. You should define success because it looks different for everybody. And I guess my experience of one of the biggest pieces of advice I have is that I'm a lifetime athlete. And one of the biggest things I knew while training is I can't go seven days a week 
twice a day without ever having a break to, to come back together. My muscles wouldn't work the same. My level of productivity would go down. It just wouldn't be my optimal self. And it really does translate the same way, I think, for entrepreneurship. If I was, and that's with me knowing myself and how I work, if I were to go nonstop, no breaks, not taking anything in, my productivity would go down. Probably my sentences wouldn't even make sense anymore. I'm just not working at my best self. And so making sure that you kind of can take learn from that. Maybe you do something you realize, I didn't like that that much. I didn't, I don't like starting my day later than, you know, 6 a.m. I like starting my days earlier. I know that's my most optimal plan. And I'm able to kind of work that in and move forward. But taking it along the way, you don't need to know everything as you start off, but just taking those little notes and reflections that you're able to make the most optimal um, situation for yourself. I think that that is the key for success because as Josh was saying, there's always going to be a moving target. So you got to really know what does success look like for you? What is your most optimal space and so that you're able to create that for you? That's a great point. Before we can look outward, got to look inward, got to know yourself. Thank you, Jasmine. AD and Amanda? Yes. Yeah, so for us, success is uh, doing what you, so I would say Tony Robbins. I'm actually stealing this from Tony Robbins. So I always have to give credit when do you, and um, you know, he says that success is um, doing what you want when you want, but whom you want as much as you want to. Um, and for us, you know, as, as we grow our business and in our journey, we've been able to do some of that, but really what we're, you know, targeting is being able to do that at any period. Um, so for an Amanda and I, we want to um, travel the world for a year. Um, and we want to do that when we are 40. So we just turned 30 this year. So we have a decade. So everything that we do is actually towards that goal. Um, and we owe it to ourselves, right? Because at the end of the day, um, you know, the point of building a business is to be able to build a life that um, is worth leaving and a legacy that other people can also um, be proud of. So for us, that's our benchmark. That's what we work towards every day. Um, and we have um, a defined goal of how we're gonna get there, right? So it's just not saying it is actually um, like we've said on this call, how do I now implement that? And how do I measure it and make sure that each year, each month, I'm actually um, a step closer? And one of the things that, um, you know, with the goal, if you have that long-term goal, it's awesome, right? You're working towards it. But one of the things that I have found is that a lot of people get hung up on, you know, this is my goal for the entire year. I actually like to break it down by quarter and say, what am I going to do in the first quarter? And then the middle of the first quarter, I figure out my goals for the next quarter. So it's like figuring out a more step-by-step -step process. But the one thing to remember, especially as an entrepreneur, do not care what anyone else thinks about you except for your customers, right? Everyone else in the say, it's a terrible idea. It's not going to work. And if you stress about what everyone else thinks about you, you will never be successful because you're worried about do they think you're successful versus if you're successful. So it's really caring about your customers, focusing on your customers. And if you really focus on that, then whatever your definition of success is, you'll be able to achieve it as long as you're the one determining on if you're successful or not. So Jasmine mentioned how you need to know yourself and, and optimize your routine. On that same note, what habits would you say you needed to develop in order to reach your success? And we'll start with Jasmine here. Absolutely, I should have switched my answers. It's better for this one, but I think it really does start with figuring out, like everyone was saying, like what's some way that kind of works for you? For me, I kind of track it by energy. So I know that I get very energized by ideas. I have these brainstorming sessions. And so I make sure to schedule that in. I make sure that I have the pieces that give me energy as well as also knowing what else I need to do to kind of get things done. I think AD said it well that you're not always going to be doing everything that you love with your business. There's so many sides that keep things operating. So there's naturally going to be things that maybe give you energy and naturally going to be things that might be taken away. And so making sure that you have your schedule built out that you are refilling yourself, that you're able to do the things that maybe takes a little bit longer. In my end, is anything inventory related is gonna drain me, I already know that. But a nice brainstorming session, figuring out our next steps, where are we going from here, anything strategy related, builds me right back up. And so I think those are some habits that I've picked up. Thanks, Jasmine. Adi and Amanda? Um, I think it's being okay with the mundane. Um, a lot of our habits are the boring things that create massive results. So the picking up the phone and connecting with those clients, they don't pick up. Okay. Calling them again and again and again. <laughs> so getting comfortable with the, the most mundane and 
just boring things that are not necessarily sexy when it comes to the world of entrepreneurship. Um, there's this quote, I don't know who said it, but it, is, it says success is simple, not easy. And what it means is that the simplicity of it is that the, the simplicity lives, in, I mean, the success lives in the most simplistic task. And the hard part, the part that's not easy is following through with those super simplistic tasks that don't necessarily have the flashy perspective of entrepreneurship. But those really mundane, boring habits, um, whether it's getting up at 6.30 a.m., that's hard extremely hard for me. I'm not a morning person, never been. <laughs> or or um, like I said, lead generating every day, hour and a half every day, like that, those things are really hard. Those habits create massive results throughout our business. I think one of the other things is that, you know, the underlying aspect of it is, is the why, right? Why is this task, why is this thing I'm doing every day why is it gonna impact the business? Why is it gonna impact me? So it's saying, if I'm trying to do this, if I'm trying, you know, say for instance, someone tells you to run a Facebook ad and now you're focusing eight hours a day on this Facebook ad, you know, why are you even doing a Facebook ad? Could you instead pick up the phone like Amanda's saying and go call that someone? So it's figuring out what tasks you're doing every day, why they're actually impacting you or the business and really boiling it down. So at the end of the day, if, if you can figure out that why, I bet you that task like task list gets much shorter and probably a lot of the other stuff you can offload to other people. So it's figuring out what that why is to move yourself and the business forward. Mm. It's, that's a, it's, these are excellent points that are being made. The why, um, knowing you know, how to go and prioritize on um, AD, what you said about the, that, uh, that 20%, right? That 20% goes and leads to the 80% uh, of uh, of your income or 80% in that growth of that company. So one other thing that I want to go back and uh, at this point almost harp on is, um, is iteration and failing fast. And so one of the things I have is just to go and steal that line, um, you know, knowing when to hold them and knowing when to fold them. So that's one of these things that I've, uh, that I've learned. I, I talked a moment ago about uh, my big failure with uh, interactive instruction, right? Good idea. Uh, great infrastructure and all these things that I can go and uh, compliment about it, but it wasn't delivered well at the right time. And I should have gotten out uh, sooner. And so what I've really learned is starting is, um, though I've increased my ability to, uh, to sacrifice and, uh, and stay in the fight. And that's extremely important. Um, but I've, uh, and I've also increased my willingness to delay gratification and uh, stay the course when uh, things look like a, uh, a long, hard road. But at the same time, I've increased my ability to look for these small wins as leading indicators that I should continue to persevere and to pursue that goal or fail fast and go and get into ideation. These big ideas, as Yasmin had said, um, you know, what is it that's coming into this brainstorm that I could be doing instead? Thank you guys. This is uh, some great value that's been delivered. Mary, would you like to have some questions from the audience? Yes, I have a bunch of questions coming in. Um, so Jack asks, can anyone speak to the process of coming up with an idea for a side hustle if you don't have uh, I'll, I'll jump in just because um, Reddit has given me uh, so much and I've been on there since uh, their early days, but there's, uh, there's subs for side hustles. There are subs for um, sole proprietor businesses, business ideas, et cetera. Whatever you can think of, uh, that's a forum um, to go and, uh, and find that niche. And well, the idea that I met my co-founder there and we started a business together after um, only having met, I think, uh, in person. I think at that time we had met uh, one time. Uh, everything else was online and on the phone. So one idea is surf the net. One of the things to note is your idea does not have to be original. So you can make the exact same business as anyone else. Um, you know, so go ahead, build anything you want. Like for instance, if you only have $1,000, go search sweaty startups online. So 
Squatty Startups has a list of literally every business that you can build with pretty much no money. You can start a power washing company, a gutter cleaning business. You do not have to start that next multi-billion dollar company. So totally go ahead and copy other people. That's what most large corporations do is they just copy one another, which we all just saw with Twitter and LinkedIn now rolling out stories. Snapchat started it and Instagram and Facebook. So go ahead and copy everyone else. It's okay. Thank you. Andrew asks, how did you decide to when to hire employees and how did you go about that process? Leverage is everything. So um, what we did um, is we decided to save their salary. That's what we did. Um, and that that may not and that may not necessarily be everybody's like jam but what we decided to do i think it was seven months seven or eight months of their salary not the whole entire year seven or eight months of their salary in a secondary account um and then um hiring and finding talent was another big failure we went through quite a few people yeah. all even started them <laughs> quite a few people and even started them especially in our in operations just the just finding a, a second to be able to just process paperwork um but before we even went to full-time employees um i would even start as small as being able to get contract work so what i mean is looking at websites like fiverr upwork things like that where you can pay a small fee to get a small item done. Cause that's another way to be able to scale your business a lot faster is what little items can I get off of my plate immediately? So for instance, graphics, we're in real estate, we're in finance. What do I need to be on Canva or Photoshop for hours figuring out a logo and color theory? No, no, go straight to Fiverr and pay 35 to $50 and have someone give it to me in 24 hours. And I say, yes or no, it, it works for me or not. Um, the same thing with all, there's a number of things. There's everything, everything from even your, even finding CPAs to be able to go over your books with your bookkeepers to go over your books with you. There are, there are people in these websites. Fiverr is a really good one. That's super cheap. And then Upwork, it's a little bit more expensive, but the, what I find is the quality is a little bit higher there. And, um, that that's a good way to start small, to be able to just pay up front. This is what I want done and you'll get the outcome back. Yeah. I want to follow on with what you just said there because CloudSploit was built in this uh, gig economy. So by the time we exited, we still had the same number of employees that we started with. Everyone else was uh, was a contractor. And we did this in, in what I'm, I kind of call like a mesh network. Some items uh, were done piecemeal as piecework. And we were able to go and hire uh, several people across the world, it didn't matter to go and deliver discrete units of work. And other people had to rely on those pieces of work to do their next job or whatever it was. And everyone could go and work when they want, in essence, what they wanted to work on. And we were able to go and use that Upwork platform to just kind of bring everybody together. And uh, so that's one of these things when, when looking. One, Automate. What is it that you can automate? And realize when I say automation, you do not need to automate end to end. What portion of that workflow can you automate? And then just deal with the spaces between. And then hire, as was just mentioned, that, um, that contractor, that gigster, that can come in and potentially reduce that gap. You may still need to be involved. And iterate such a, you know, in that way until you can go and uh, what I call you know, enabling the human, right? Uh, just to even further add on, definitely use Upwork and Fiverr where we could, um, but also we start off with people within our network. Our, our first hire was a friend of ours, it's a contract hire to do sales with us, but then we actually over the summer, we had our first internship program and so we just put it out there and um, we had a lot of people actually were interested in, so you using just common things like LinkedIn or Indeed, and we were just surprised by how well it was received, and we found so much great talent, and so many people actually stayed on our team. That's how we built up the team of nine. So we started actually, I guess probably the largest way of, of adding people to our team was through the internship as well. All right, um, another David, a different David, not David, our panelist, asks, how did you market your side hustle when you were first starting and how did you manage it with your main hustle? Yeah. 
of Cloudsploit, we marketed through thought leadership. One is our, we're an open core SaaS. So the engine was open, was open source. You could see it on GitHub and people could go and contribute to it. So these enthusiasts from around the world um, could go and do it. But then we built infrastructure to go and deliver that engine. So think of the, the car around the engine. And that's what we sold was that automation and that simplicity. Um, and so one of the things that we did at that time was this concept of serverless infrastructure was quite new. And we released a, a, an, an article, um, or Matthew did, uh, released an article calling, uh, saying that um, we brought our, um, you know, how we did serverless infrastructure. You know, we made our uh, company serverless. And that got a lot of attention. And that brought more people that were interested in infrastructure, that were interested, interested in infrastructure security. And so we continued to go and deliver thought leadership. In fact, one of the upworkers or one of the contractors that uh, we had was a person who um, all I did was uh, I said to him, um, go out to these Q&A sites where people had questions about things and answer the absolute hardest questions you can. Don't link to us. Don't, you know, unless it's absolutely uh, relevant, um, but just go and find and research and give great answers to the hardest questions in that are relevant to our niche. Now, don't think that I'm fully altruistic with this one because one of the things that he did is enter it in a, um, use a profile that was named Cloudsploit. So people could see that Cloudsploit was contributing to our community uh, with thought leadership. And this uh, continual showing up on uh, top rated answers, um, helped us be known and respected. And to a point earlier, we did need to go and iterate to go and find uh, that, uh, that gem um, inside of the community. Okay, um, Ashley asked, going back to setting goals, do you have any tools or resources that keep you organized and focused on your target? I can pop in on this one. I absolutely live and die by my Asana and Google Calendar together, but definitely Asana for product project management. You can add everybody on your team and you can even set it up like you have the different boards and postcards. So it still feels very startup-y, even though it's not in person with an actual postcard, but I'm able to have these different boards. So one for finance and strategy, one for marketing, one for operations. And so everybody's able to see what everyone's doing, can check things off, give encouragement through thumbs up when someone does a good job, well done. And it, it really keeps the whole team still together, even though we're all separate. Like I said, we did the internship over the summer. I think that's when we really started using Asana and it was people literally from all over the place. So we never saw each other all together, but we felt like a cohesive team because we had Asana. We felt like we were on the same page because we had something kind of to ground us together. And there's a lot of other sites out there like monday.com and a whole list of other ones, but just finding some central way to have some sort of project management tool has been really efficient and helpful for us. Yeah, we use Asana as well. I, I love it. Um, and so Asana, Asana with Slack, and then we have all of our mail goes to a server called Earth Class Mail that they scan my mail in and send it to me. And then we use different automation with Zapier. Um, to us, the more automation, the more tracking we can do, the better. I think today we had 486 automated tasks on the business side um, that, that ran. So the more automation, the more task management that we can do, the better, especially as you scale up you'll see that what you did when you're only a team of four, which we were in January to now a team of 18, everything internally we had to rebuild, right? Because the way that you would use to manage employees, the way you'd assign tasks, they break. So the, the more that you can track things from the onset, the better. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me, Jason asks, if your idea is in fintech, and I don't necessarily think that this question applies directly to a fintech industry, it could um, go across industries. How can you find and connect with programmer, programmers or engineers that you can trust if you do not have the tech skills needed to build your idea? Uh, 
I would question if you even need a developer to start. You know, like I just talked to a friend a few days ago. He's building a fintech company, and he is truly doing customer research for the first six months to really figure out what is actually needed. And he figured out a way to do an MVP where there's a very nice landing page. And it looks like it's automated. Once that user clicks submit, nothing is automated. It is him on the back end manually doing everything to make sure it works because he want to make sure that there's actually that customer demand there before he spends the next 10 years of his life doing it. So, you know, I would, no matter what company it is, I would dumb it down and figure out how can you get to market the fastest um, and then go the next way. It's the same thing if, you know, if you're doing, let's say, an automated postcard company, right? Say, for instance, you know, Yasmin, when, when an order comes in and she wants to send a postcard to someone saying, thank you for buying these, you know, th this product, instead of using an automated system that sends out a postcard, well, she can create an automated task that tells someone on her team, go write that postcard. Now she can then check, does there, is there even conversion from that postcard? If yes, after a few weeks, let me then go fully automated. But until you can prove it out, don't waste the time automating it. The same thing with your developer. Figure out if people actually need this. Do an MVP before going to hire that developer. Um, Brittany asks, knowing what you know now, what is one thing you would have done differently than when you first started your business? Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I, you want to go first? Yeah, it's, for me, I would say uh, just hiring quicker, okay. um, full time. Um, we, we did a lot of 1099 contractors and we overworked ourselves for two years, just again, making sure that um, the business could stand on its own. Mm -hmm. um, and you we know, were under leveraged. Yeah, we were under leveraged. So we realized that we were capping ourselves and we were capping the business. And it's because we didn't want to let go. Um, and then we realized, uh, I think one thing as business owners or founders is that um, as long as the person can do the job 80% or more, it's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, you'd be surprised at people who actually rise up to the occasion mm -hmm. and actually do a phenomenal job. Um, so, again, it's just being able to let go and, and let others come in into your world. Again, we understand it's your baby and you've grown it, mm -hmm. but in, for, in order for it to grow from, you know, a that toddler. Baby, that baby got to walk. Let that baby walk. <laughs> you need a team to be able to get there. <laughs> um, I would say for me, um, it was not being so scared. Like just jumping in front of my fear because on the other side of my fear was my greatest breakthrough. Not to sound cliche, but, it was, but I'm being so honest. There were so many moments where I was just scared of taking action. And I wish there were, and there were so many moments, not necessarily missed opportunities, but delayed opportunities had I just woke up and just leaped and just trusted no matter what happened. I just was okay in being down for the adventure. So, and I'm, and actually I'm still dealing with that, to be honest. I'm, I think that's an entrepreneurial thing. It's just taking action immediately versus sitting on it and overthinking it and want to make it perfect. Just just going going harder all the time um this is a question that actually came through um the registration but i really wanted to ask it because i think it's a good one um did you need to invest personal funds into your startup and then how did you secure this funding Upright is fully bootstrapped. Um, we never went for outside funding. All the businesses I've built, I've never gone for outside funding. Um, really quick story, uprightlabs.com, we actually took some money, we threw it into a cryptocurrency and made some money off it. And we were able to buy uprightlabs.com, the domain name, because we initially had the .co. Um, other than that, we did not invest any money in the business. And we used our initial service revenue to power the software growth. And as we've grown now, we utilize revenue to, to fund the growth. Um, and I believe in sustainable growth, meaning as you bring new revenue in and it's proven revenue, then you can go to higher. So we have not gone for outside funding. I know a lot of my friends and other businesses have, um, but I haven't because I don't believe that the industry we're in, the customer we're going after, um, I don't believe that we need the tens of millions of dollars to get there. Instead, that we can, we can still grow the way we need to by looking at different avenues.
think for starting out, there's so many resources that um, may not know, like grants, pitch opportunities, just so many things that you can kind of apply for me, people you know, maybe just to talk to people. There's so many different opportunities. I think I can definitely say started right here at Smith for me, with the Dingman Center. Um, there's a lot. We, we, I did Terp Startup, which is an accelerator. I got a little bit of seed funding there. I ultimately did their 2019 pitch competition, and I won the pitch competition, which was $15,000 to kind of get started, which was huge. And then I the company was still completely ours. So there's a lot of different opportunities too to add money in addition to bootstrapping. I know people might come from different levels of starting off, but for us starting as a student, those grants, those little opportunities were huge for us. Um, and as we continue to grow from there, we can we had bigger opportunities, bigger pitches, bigger opportunities that grew from those smaller seeds starting off. So. Yeah, it's just uh, touching on what David and um, J Jasmine said. So we also have bootstrap. Um, we live with revenue first. So we always play green light, red light, right? So anytime you want to take on a new tool, a new, a new effort, you know, what is the return on that investment? Um, and then, um, so again, I, so our job was the, the, the very first with income. Um, and now um, we actually make sure that we don't allow our lifestyles to get in front of where our revenue is, right? So we always make sure that we, uh, we're actually living the way when we first started the business and we take incremental grow, uh, incremental increases. And then at a certain point, we're actually going to freeze our salaries, right? Because again, how you grow and how you make more profit is actually um, not only reducing, um, not only growing your income, but also reducing expenses and stabilizing. All right, if we don't have any more questions, I'm gonna turn it back over to John um, for our closing. Thank you all, thank you for everyone for attending and to our panelists for sharing all of your great information with us all. Thanks, Mary, and thank you all for joining us tonight. It's energizing to see how much interest the Smith community has in this topic. I'd like to leave you with one closing thought for anyone who may be on the fence about pursuing a side hustle. Perfect is the enemy of good. This is one of my favorite quotes. Perfect is the enemy of good. Don't overanalyze a problem for hours and hours when you could have acted on your first good idea and created something real. Like Amanda just mentioned, if you have an idea that solves a problem, you need to execute. And like David said a few minutes ago, you don't even need to have an original idea. The absolute most important thing is to take action. We have a few closing administrative notes this webinar recording will be sent to everyone once we add the closed captioning. We invite everyone to connect to our panelists on LinkedIn. And to our audience who is looking for more advice for their side hustles, we invite you to check out Dingman Fridays, hosted by the Dingman Center for Entrepreneurship at Marilyn Smith. This is an opportunity for you to share your idea and get one-on-one -on -one advice and feedback from venture mentors, subject matter experts, guest advisors, or Dingman Center staff. Mary is, is going to add the link in the chat. All right, thank you all for joining. We'll also include that link in the email that we send out um, in case you don't grab it from the chat. Um, but I hope everyone enjoyed um, tonight's event and got a lot out of it. And thank you again to our panelists for their time. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. It was fun. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.